This webinar is sponsored by Vox. Upgrade your internet to Vox Fiber today and experience all the benefits of consistent, secure, fast, reliable, and cost-effective connectivity. I was trying to work out how to kind of tell the things that I've learned running a business, which was not what I studied. I studied English literature. I wanted to spend my life studying literature and, you know, reading about the, the, the great artists in the world. And yet I studied, I took journalism because I thought it was interesting and it took me on a, such a different life path. I, I would never have expected. I've ended up running a business. I've run a business through COVID. I've met some amazing and famous people, but I'm going to try and um, run you through it. So I'm just going to start sharing what I want. Um, there we go. Let's start sharing that. Okay, so that should be visible to everybody. Is everybody, can everybody see my slides? Just double checking if anyone else, if Angela, if it's not coming through, please just let me know. So my name is Toby Shapshak and I started a, a business um, some time ago. Uh, obviously, when you're doing a live webinar, um, something will go wrong as it just has because it, it hasn't put my slides where I can look at them. So I have to just look to the sides. Firstly, welcome to uh, the second of these wonderful World at Work um, events. The, uh, uh, the first one was just a kind of introduction to how the world has fantastically changed. And this webinar is going to take that a little bit further. And I'm going to talk about the things I've learned in the last 50 years. I'm uh, turned 50 last year. I don't know what happened just the other day. I was this angry, fired up 20 something. So this webinar is sponsored by Vox. Upgrade your internet to Vox Fiber today and experience all the benefits of consistent, secure, fast, reliable, and cost-effective connectivity. Visit vox.co.za for more information. I actually am a Vox user, so it's coming to you via Vox. But first, there's a little bit of important news we have to talk about, which is that um, uh, we've had some amazing, this is the, the Mars rover, the current Mars rover, and of course, if you're a robot and you find yourself on another planet, what do you do? You take a selfie. Um, and amazingly, today, uh, this selfie was taken a few weeks ago, but today the drone actually flew for the first time on another planet. Now I'm a bit of a space geek. Um, think that's really amazing um, and it just shows you kind of where we are going with life. In other news, uh, the most remarkable and hugest um, guerrilla marketing stunt of all time has come to an end uh, and this massive uh, ever given ship is now uh, being moved free. Of course, the memes quickly followed, didn't they, of these uh, um, hilarious uh, this poor, this one guy like trying to trudge away and the, the memes quickly come. I love this, you know, the one on on uh, the right, the crushing despair of everything in COVID, you know, and of course that's you doing your best. And that's kind of how it's felt for me. I'm sure many of the parents, especially anyone who owns their own business has probably felt the same. Um, and it really has been a quite a remarkable time because it's brought all of us together in a way we hadn't expected. Um, I think, and, and it's made us, I suppose, in many ways, more conscious of what we have and, and how easily we could lose it. As I said, I studied literature and I studied uh, English and I took journalism because I thought it sounded good. And my mentor was a really amazing man called John Brett Cohen. And I thought, you know, this was this was the kind of beginning to life that that it seemed like a good idea. And the lecturer, Don, uh, Don Pinnock, was really funny, the introductory lecture. And off I went and I did journalism. And, and my life story has been really interesting because I don't speak maths as a first language. I'm not a mathematically inclined person. I love physics and science and I love reading biographies of these great mathematicians and scientists, but I don't understand the maths. And my father wanted me to be a doctor. I had this fantasy of studying physics, but it turns out you can't study physics or be a doctor if you don't do maths. So I became a journalist and it was a really quite a remarkable ride personally. Um, I ended up doing a whole bunch of things and then of course, I, as luck would have it, um, as luck would have it, I ended up uh, owning this magazine stuff. But along the way, I met a couple of famous people. Uh, I got to meet Nelson Mandela, 
and uh, the Dalai Lama. I also went and uh, met Steve Jobs. I touched his iPod. Uh, you see, he doesn't have it drying around his neck. This was at a big launch in Paris. I have a much nicer picture, but I saved this picture or I used this picture because um, on the far right of left of your screen is Tim Apple, as Donald Trump called him, or Tim Cook. Uh, and, and Apple has just been, you know, one of those companies that's been truly remarkable. And the world we live in wouldn't be possible without it. I got to meet uh, the other Steve. Um, and interviewed him, obviously, using a, you can see an iPhone on my desk to record the interview and an iPhone, a uh, laptop to record it. I covered the Eugene to Blanche funeral in 2010 with a yarmulke, I kid you not, I was a little reckless, but what happens if you, what happens if a couple of Jews go to a white supremacist funeral and you put on your yarmulke? And then from about 2010, quite a remarkable thing happened in the world, which was everyone started noticing just how remarkable Africa was and just how remarkable the way we solve problems has become. And we, we saw a real, you know, rush of enthusiasm um, and uh, it was really great. But there'd been a lot of damage that had been done before in terms of the economy. And this was just really something quite remarkable that suddenly Africa was considered from being you know, the, the hopeless continent, I should have put in the, 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 the economist cover that said the hopeless continent, because 10 years later, everyone was calling us uh, uh, the hopeful continent and Africa's rising. And of course, we did. And what was it that we did that was so remarkable? We solved problems. We had a, a remarkable number of difficult problems, not least of which was access to money. And this guy, um, I, was, I took this picture in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, why where i was asking people what they did with mpesa and how they used it and he was showing me how he could do it and of course half of all mobile money accounts in the world right now are in africa and we are by far the leaders of this new way of doing mobile money we we you know we pioneered it we have so few resources in so many other ways, and yet we have this incredible ability to solve problems. And it's often called frugal innovation or innovation out of necessity. But what it basically is, is that we have problems. There's no other way to solve them. No one else is going to solve them. So we solve them for ourselves, you know, as MPESA shows you. In fact, I love taking a picture of this guy. I was like asking, he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Puts on his sunglasses and says, okay. Now you can take a picture. Everybody wants to look good. We've solved so many problems for ourselves that it turns out the rest of the world have the same problems, access to electricity, access to finance, and they come from all over the place. Uh, there is uh, on, on the left um, screen left is, is a guy in a gray t-shirt. He's the Cambridge Analytica uh, person on the Facebook board kidding but this is a brilliant company in, in Kenya called Brick and they provide they're now the largest provider of free public Wi-Fi free public Wi-Fi around Africa um, and Mark Zuckerberg came to have a look at it and then I got very lucky I, I, I was asked to do a TED talk in in Edinburgh in 2013 and uh, it, it was quite a life-changing thing I got lots of views and basically what I was saying was this theory of frugal innovation, how we solve problems. And I and I I love that old South African saying, a boer maka plan, a farmer makes a plan, because it so typifies our can-do attitude as a as a people, as a country. We get stuff done because we have to and no one else can do it. Um, and as a result of that, uh, I've had a whole different career resulting in me doing these kind of public talks and this kind of, of talk for all of you. And, and what I'm really trying to do, and I, and I hope it comes across, is not blow my own trumpet. I, I, I never think anyone should blow their own trumpet. No one ever believes you, and, it's, and it's, it's callous, and it's trite, and it's irritating. But I never expected this. I wanted to study English literature, and I did journalism because it seemed fun and interesting. And my life went on this roller coaster ride. And then um, I got married. In 2001 to my first wife and we went on holiday to this beautiful place called Nature's Valley and two days after I got back from my first honeymoon I was retrenched which was a pretty awful thing to happen but 
I realized that it had nothing to do with me. I, I didn't run the business into the ground or run out of funding. It wasn't anything to do with me. And as someone said to me, that's really terrible. You know, you got retrenched. I said, listen, thank God it was two days after my honeymoon and not two days before my honeymoon because I would have, uh, at least I got a holiday. And without really knowing it and intending to do it, I ended up starting and running a business. And the reason I did it was because a friend of mine was going freelance at the time and his wife was pregnant with their first child who's now in third year uh, studying in Cape Town. And I was worried, he was worried that he wouldn't have enough income and I was worried. And I said to him, you know, I've got so much work going on right now. I'll tell you what, I'll pool it and we can both do it. And I had a very unique way of doing business. You know, 20 years later, I've learned a lot about business and, and learned what I never knew. And, you know, as I often say, people who don't know how hard things are never do them. You know, people do amazing things in their 20s because, you know, they're not, they, they haven't been uh, told they can't do it. And, and because I didn't know what I was doing and what I should do, I did the things that seemed obvious and seemed pragmatic. Um, and that's how my business career kind of started. One of my first clients was Standard Bank. In fact, my first big client. Um, and what they needed was the entire website rewritten. It was a surreal experience. I went downtown to Joburg. This, you know, um, it was, uh, it's it past Bank City. Standard Bank's right at the back of downtown. And I, I went into this building. There were these funny, they were like tubes from a Star Trek movie. You like walked into them and they closed and opened. And it was really quite surreal. And we went in and we, <laughs> we did this presentation myself and my, my first business partner. I just realized I've always gone into business with women. My first business partner, and we went and we did this presentation and it was frankly a pretty poor presentation. And we saw the people doing the presentation before us and they had this amazing PowerPoint presentation. The door was open once or twice. So we saw through and I, was, I said to my partner, she said to me, she said to me, what are we going to do? And I said to her, I don't know. And we went in and I said, listen, I, I saw those guys before us. They did a really great presentation. I'm sorry to tell you, but our presentation is a little slacker. I managed to find one of my old slides. That wasn't my very first presentation, but this is one of Maven Media's credential presentations. My first presentation was two pages. The first page had my uh, Maven Media logo that I, I'd, I'd had designed. And the second page had our contact numbers, just the two of us. So um, I said to the people in the room, listen, we don't do presentations. We're journalists. We work with the app we use is Word. We don't use PowerPoint. You want a good PowerPoint presentation, get those guys. If you want people who work in Word, that's us. That's what we do. And for a long time, Maven Media was a, was a great little business. We, we did... Uh, we did a lot of business. You can see Standard Bank, the World Summit. We did some work for Edgars, for Jetta, for Microsoft, for Accenture, Incredible Connection, MTN. It was a good list of customers for my little, <clears throat> my little business. You have to excuse me, please. <clears throat> I've had a sinus infection for two days. So my throat gets very dry. So <clears throat> in the very first meeting at Standard Bank, after they called us back and said, actually, we're going to go with you. And the woman who did it said to me, <clears throat> you know what really swung it for us was your comment about word. And really all I thought about was I just told her the truth. I just did it sarcastically and, you know, and, and that seemed to pay off. But I thought about it a lot and I, and, and I thought about it, how I learned to do business stuff. So there I am, a journalist, I'm sitting in the meeting, I've won the contract and now we've got a lot of work to do. And everything the woman said, I typed because that was what I was used to. I went to a press conference and I typed what people did, 60 words a minute. And, I, and then when I got back to my office, which is a room in my house, um, in my flat at the time, I took the notes she'd said and I turned them into a proposal and I went back to her and she went, that's exactly what I want. You've nailed it. You've got exactly what I meant. And it was, I didn't know what to say or do because all I did is what I was trained to do as a journalist, which is take notes, listen, 
and faithfully record what happened. And it was one of those great breakthrough moments that I realized was one of those important life skills, you know, and, and this is really the essence of this World at Work seminar series. You know, my business partner, Sally Hudson, has four daughters, two in varsity, two in school. I have a son who's going to be four next year, uh, next month. And, and we've been talking, I've been thinking a lot about what will he need, what skills will he need in life to, to succeed? You know, when I started journalism in 1989, I started studying, I matriculated in 88, that's a long time ago. Um, the only people who had to touch type for their business, that was a necessary skill for your business, were journalists and secretaries. By the time I finished my degree, four years later, everybody was learning to touch type in high school, in primary school. Um, and I, I've been thinking, like, what skills do I need to teach my son? Like, what are the things a father needs to teach his son? And, I, and one of the, the things I thought of is he will never learn to touch time. Almost certainly, I, I can't imagine by the time he starts interacting with computers, we will still be stuck on the keyboard because actually we've, we've mastered this way of talking to computers like we talk to each other and all of these uh, digital assistants, Alexa, Siri, Cortana, Google's Assistant, all of these are, uh, Bixby from Samsung, all of these are the very first version of how we, I think, we will ultimately end up interfacing with computers. We will talk to them. Sure, they're not going to get sarcasm. You know, every computer might be Sheldon Cooper. Um, they're not going to get the sarcasm, but they will understand us. And I think those, those are the life skills that, you know, I couldn't have, I couldn't do my job without a driver's license. In 15 years, uh, or 13 years, when my 14 years, when my son, you know, gets his driver's license or learner's license, will he ever need to drive a car? Will he need to know? I mean, what are the odds? The odds are you can get into a car and it will drive you somewhere. I mean, we hope. Um, so that is the kind of thing that this started with. What are the skill sets going to be for us? in life that we're going to need. And I, and I got a, I got a, I had one other very good piece of, of good fortune. I, I got asked within three weeks before the World Summit on Sustainable Development to build the website. And it was a, it was a really strange kind of situation. It came via, bizarrely enough, the same friend I'd started my business for. And he said, um, this is a really great job, but hey, we're having our second kid, so you do it, you run it. And, and, and that's how I did it. I ran it, he did some work, we, you know, we all, I hired all, all the other journalists on you. And it was really fascinating because suddenly I wasn't just a journalist, suddenly I was like interfacing with this monstrosity of, a, of, a, of, the, of the organization for this event. And I had to do three weeks, three months worth of work in three weeks. It was mind boggling. And, and yet we did it because the one skill you learn as a journalist is that you have to deliver, full stop. Your deliverables have to be met no matter what. So if the news editor would say to me, I want a 400 word story on the Cape Town fires, and I came back and said, actually, it's not a, uh, you know, it's not a arson attack. It was just a poor homeless man, you know, who set things alight. It doesn't matter how the story changes. At the end of the day, I have to file 400 words. There's a pay, there's, you know, and I'm thinking old fashioned newspapers. There's a block, you know, on the page waiting for my copy. It doesn't matter what happens, you have to get the job done. And, and that's one of the best life skills I think I've ever come across. When I interview people and they show me that they've got a, a matric or a, or a university degree, all that tells me is that People know how to complete something, unless you're a doctor or an engineer or a, a lawyer, then you've got to, you know, pass absolutely everything. And, and that knowledge, of course, you've got to know where every bone and the metatarsal bones in your hands are if you're a doctor. And you've got to learn all those big words they keep throwing at us. It's very intimidating. I don't know about you. Um, but they, lots of people, certainly in journalism or the art space, what that degree tells me is that people have learned how to do a certain job and get it done. And that job was study at university and get good marks. Of course, I don't want to say that to the universities, but it's one of the pointers, I think, in the industry that I'm in. So after this uh, World Summit uh, uh, gig, something really terrible and 
tragic happened to our family. My late brother, this is the last photograph I took of the two of us. Um, on the day he died that night, very blurry, and he was a builder. He was in construction. Both my brothers started life as plumbers, and my mother's an architect, and my brother and I were building my parents a house. It was the property boom. Um, and we were going to renovate. There was his big, his, 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 you know, his masterwork, his Meisterwerk, um, this really great house he was building. And, and he had a heart attack. And one day I was a journalist and the next day I was running a construction company, which I did for six months. And at one point I was speaking to a friend of mine. She was my boss at the Mail and Garden, uh, my friend Ferrell. And she said, what do you know about construction? And I said to her, <laughs> I mean, I wasn't laughing then, but I said, not as much as I'm going to know in two weeks' time. And my mentor, John Brett Cohen, always used to have these maxims. He would say things as a kind of like an organizing principle. And I, and I made a maxim for myself where I spoke. Someone said, what's going on? And I said, adversity comes along to show you what you're made of. And that's how I dealt with it. And, I, and I've, you know, I've always had these mechanisms for dealing with really tough situations. I always used to say to myself, I've lived to something worse, I've survived worse, I've done something worse. And this really was, at the time, the worst thing that had happened to me, worse than my divorce. It was my brother. Uh, we were very close. He was the oldest, I was the youngest, and we were building a place for my parents. Their property, their money from their house sale was wrapped up, and basically the whole family was bankrupt. And after six months, we all walked away and we'd like kind of pulled it back from the brink. And adversity showed me what I was made of. And in the worst situation where I could think of nothing worse that had ever happened to me, I thought of my forebears who were part of the Holocaust and walked out of those concentration camps. A lot of my grandfather, my grandfather was one of 11 brothers. There was only him and his one brother left after the Second World War. And I thought to myself, if those people could walk out of a concentration camp after suffering the humiliations and the degradations and the, the outright cruelty of that and still fall in love and get married and have kids, then if they can get up and go, I can get up and go. And that's, that's how I got myself through it. I, I didn't drink for six months. I just learned things every day. Every day I learned something new and I was just willing to learn. And that's kind of how this conversation developed. And that's, you know, in, in the conversation with, with Angela, the last talk I did last year before COVID struck was for Cura for a whole bunch of, of teachers about, you know, digital shifts and where things are going and what's happening. And, and I thought, you know, I studied English literature. I'm not numerically savvy. If people say numbers to me, I have to write the numbers down. Um, and, you know, I have to check them. I, I don't know. I can, I can tell you quotes. Tihi, quoth she, and flap the window, and clap the window too. You know, I can still quote in that strange old English from, from Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. I remember lines from movies, you know, Donald Rumsfield, Rumsfield, there's known and unknowns. If they're words, they sit in my brain. Numbers, not so much. But, and thankfully, I was born Jewish, and I got Seichel uh, with the gene code. Seichel means financial common sense. And in fact, it's just plain old common sense and pragmatism. My mother's a truly extraordinary woman. She was the 14th woman architect in South Africa. She was the first person who was all of these, English, a woman and Jewish, to get a degree from Pretoria University or faculty. And she is pragmatic or pragmatism incarnate. And that's what she taught us. She taught us just how to do things and how to solve problems, which was really kind of necessary because that's all I did on a building site was solve problems, learn more skills and solve problems. And that's what I say you do running a business. I'm very clear that I'm not an entrepreneur. I dislike, I mean, I'm a words person, so words have a very specific meaning for me. I'm a businessman. I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm not, I didn't build anything brand new that didn't exist before. You know, I, I built what I had. I've done, I've run a business, you know. I may have launched it in the country, but it's a franchise. Stuff is a, is a, a publication in the UK. And in fact, uh, my business partner and I were astounded that we survived COVID and we made a profit, amazingly enough. And I'll tell you a little bit about that later. Jewish guilt is a business model. Fantastic. But we survived COVID and we, we carried on growing. So let's just 
fast forward back to stuff. And this is, you know, this is what I do these days, deciding whether to put blue or green on the cover. But we have people who work for us and looking after the people who work for us was my priority for the last year. I said to people, I'm a part time journalist and my job is to make sure that my people have salaries and that everybody's fine. And, and we did. And it's been quite a thing, hasn't it? This surviving this crazy world. I mean, if you think about it, and, and I have been, it's the last time the world went through something that affected all of us, that, that rattled the whole planet, was a major world war, World War II, or, or any major war. You know, the, the world is in a, in a state where we all have to rebuild. And, it, and it's taught us a whole bunch of things. And it's taught us that people matter. Things don't matter. People matter. Um, so back to the kinds of things we're going to do in our lives. Well, what skills do we need to know? How many people, you know, when I left varsity, or I left school, I, uh, the, the, the head boy in my year, he knew he wanted to study medicine. He, he never did. But the thing that I thought was, that I envied was that he knew what he wanted to do because I didn't. Um, and I don't think that's wrong. You know, I don't, I don't think it's wrong not to know what you're going to do with your life. Just keep on moving. And one of the things that that I used to to make sense of of doing stuff in the world was was the life of of Franz Kafka, this extraordinary writer in um, uh, Prague. He was a lawyer. He worked for the Habsburgs. He was a he worked in one of the insurance companies and at night he would go home and he would write what became extraordinary literature and he reinvented uh, a whole bunch of things. So I looked at his life and, and what I knew was that I would find the thing, I would find the thing that would would make me, you know, would give me that, uh, the thing that I would do in the world. But in the meantime, I was just like going, because, you know, as a youngster, you're like, I want to change the world. You know, my best friend's mother, this extraordinary woman called Wendy Seifor, said to us when we were in our 20s, you will do more to change the world in your 20s than any other decade of your life. And she was right. You know, all the great uh, companies that we all say are so wonderful, Microsoft, Apple, uh, Facebook, Google, all of them were started by people in their 20s. You do it because you that's, you know, that's you change the world in that decade. Please remember and please go for it. So, um, you know, I, I forget where I was, but I'll, I'll just jump back into these life skills, right? So if you're going to be a doctor, absolutely, you know, you've got to know all of that. If you're not, if you're going to go into a world where we're not sure what jobs people are going to have, you know, we need to learn how to learn. I think that's by far the most important skill we need to have. We need to know how to learn because learning is is ultimately the 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 best thing about us. And I remember, <laughs> and I still joke to you know my friends, teenage kids, like the best thing about leaving school is I never had to write another maths exam. Um, but some people love maths. Some people don't like literature, which I love, and and. It's a different story, but now we live in the world of just amazing modern miracle, miracle, medic, modern medical miracle, right? You know, a year ago, the world came to a grinding halt. Um, and within, I don't know, six months, eight months, we had vaccines to do all of this. We've charted a new way of doing things. I mean, if I, we don't see a AIDS vaccine in the next couple of years, I'm going to be seriously disappointed. Um, but we live in an amazing world because so much has, has happened. And, and the, the thing that I think of, the last great, terrible, devastating pandemic was, was the Spanish flu of 1918. And it, and it broke out in the last year of, of the First World War, the, the, the Great War, it was called. And it was the first modern war. It was, you know, before that, wars were fought on horseback with swords and very rudimentary guns, the, the, you know, the First World War had artillery and, and mustard gas and, you know, really brutal, horrible, terrible things. The, the, you know, the, the, the soldiers that fought in that war experienced PTSD afterwards and they experienced things that people didn't have a, a way to talk about it. And about 20 million people um, died 
in the First World War and about another 20 million were casualties, wounded. Um, and yet in the five years, four, four years, four, five years, history teachers help me, that the First World War happened, let's say 40, 50 million people died, Spanish flu wiped out twice that in next to no time, just a bug. It was called, caused by a virus called H1N1. And about 100 years later, same virus, H1N1, reappeared called swine flu. And I caught it. I took Tamiflu and I was fine. I had a, it was like having flu, but without a head cold. You know, your body ached you. And 100 years later, this disease that wiped out the world, that was, you know, even more devastating than a global, well, a global war. And a hundred years later, you can catch the disease and, and take a pull, take a pull, and you're fine, one every day. Um, so that's what that's what makes me optimistic about the world right now. I really do think it's it's a bit tough. I can feel the president's El Presidente's pain as that needle goes in. Um, but in about a year or maybe two years, I think we'll all have had vaccines globally, um, and we'll be in a in a different position, and we'll be looking at the world in another way, and we'll be traveling again. But even though you, you, we can't travel, you know, one of my one of my staff's daughter teaches English via Skype. I know people who've been doing therapy via Skype for years. You know, Google calls have been fantastic. I, I think the one most important skill that so many people have, have have had to learn in the last year, especially all the people who are generally not the people most excited about learning new technology. What they've had to learn is that they can solve computer problems. Most people don't want to do things that they don't know about or they might look stupid. You know, I grew up in an age where teachers called you stupid and hit you on the head. And, you know, you don't ever want to do something that makes you look like you don't know what you're doing or you look foolish. And that's what that's what COVID has, has forced us all to do. We've been forced to learn a bunch of new tech skills, if nothing else. You know, I used to take my son to visit his grandmother once a week, twice a week, and you know, during COVID, they were speaking four or five times a week on FaceTime or Skype. You know, it, it's been remarkable how many people who've had such deep resistance to new skill sets have had to. There's no one; no, your kids can't come around to teach you, so you have to learn it. Um, and and I and I see that everywhere. I see a whole bunch of new skills. So how how is this? What what is it about us that we're so resistant to change and we're so resistant to doing things? And and the thing I, I realized in the last year is that humanity is designed to change. We just use a big word called evolution. But change is what it means. We are truly remarkable. Of of all the creatures on this planet, we are the most remarkable and the most destructive. Um, on the planet, but we have learned to adapt. And I, and the way I, I kind of thought about this was a few years ago, the big word of the day about 2010, so 11 years ago, the big word was disruption. And you heard it everywhere. The internet's disrupting all business models. Everything's getting disrupted, disruption, disruption. And 702 called me for, a, for an interview one day to talk about the disruption. And, and I'd been to see my optometrist a little bit earlier, uh, maybe two, three weeks before that. And the conversation I had with her really stuck in my mind, which was, she said to me, those are really nice glasses. Oh, the way it had started, I should probably say, is I got one of those SMSs to say, it's been five years since you checked your eyes coming for a test. I don't know if I went, she's a lovely lady. And she said to me, those are nice glasses, where'd you get them? And I said, because, you know, I stopped for a moment and because my mother told me, my mother, my parents told me, always tell the truth no matter what. And I always tell the truth no matter what, because, that's the best thing to do in life, bar nothing. I decided to tell her and I said, I'm sorry to be the one to tell you, but I'm never going to buy glasses from you again. And she said, why? And I said, because I bought these online. It's this fancy new business called uh, Warby Parker. GQ called them the Netflix of eyewear. It costs $100. You upload your, uh, your prescription. Um, now it's much better. You know, if you've got one of the, the new generation smartphones with you know, AR cameras, etc., cetera. Um, and, uh, and you, you're looking, 
you're looking at, um, I just want to tell the organizers, sorry, I've turned off WhatsApp. So if you're trying to message me, um, I don't know how you're going to get me plain old SMS. Sorry about that. We're back to our regular programming. Um, so she was saying to me like, you know, but but I, but we do things for you and we help you out. And, and, I, and I said to 702, you know, all the things she said to me were like, we tell you which glasses look good on your face. And I'm like, yeah, no salesman's ever going to tell you you look ugly in those Le Perla or those uh, what, you know, um, um, Louis Vuitton shoes. You know, no one's going to say that to you. And and she said, yes, but we tuck them behind your ears. So, like, you know, your heads doesn't fall off. And I said to her, OK, let's work this out. The last set of glasses I bought from you cost 5,000 Rand, you know, and this pair cost me $100, which at the time was 70, 750 Rand. And I said to her, what am I getting for another 4,000 Rand? And she told me all of these things. And, 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 and I said to her, yeah, but I just got that from the internet. Uh, everything worked perfectly. You know, I, the, the highlights, not only of buying the, Wal uh, the Warby Parkers is that a friend of mine was in the US and I got her to bring them back. I have to name drop because her name's Lauren Bjorkas. And she is the most extraordinary science fiction writer. If you haven't read Zeus, if you do now, uh, if you haven't read Mavericks, her book about amazing Maverick South African woman, you really should. Um, and she brought my glasses back for me. So they cost 750 Rand. It's, why would I ever go back to an optometrist? And we had this whole conversation and it was like talking to a horse-drawn carriage salesman. She was like, look at this year's models. You know, they had, they've got such great brass fittings. And I said, you know, it's 1904 and I'm a hipster and I want to drive me um, a Model T Ford, you know, that, that, by the way, is Henry Ford sitting in the passenger seat with that big bowler hat. And she said, yes, but look at the leather trimmings. And I said, yes, but I bet you I'm going to be more popular, you know, get laid a little bit more if I drive this car. And the conversation went backwards and forwards. And, you know, at the end of it, all I realized was that for an extra 4,000 Rand, what I'm getting from an optometrist was that. My glasses don't fall off when I put my head forward. Bizarrely, I've actually gone back to optometrists, but I'll get to that in another reason. And that's because of the Zeiss lens technology that Melon sells, which is just amazing. And my theory in life, that's a little too soon for high school kids. Uh, my theory in life is we work too hard to drink cheap whiskey, which I've really used as we work too hard not to wear comfortable shoes or, you know, um, but decent glasses. So I'm very happy to spend money on glasses because as I forgot to mention at the beginning of the seminar, I didn't get glasses until I was 13. I didn't see the blackboard. I had no idea the blackboard was part of the school experience. I knew it was there. Some people would write on it. I'd go there, I'd look at it, but I never sat in the class. I couldn't see it. I had no idea it was there. Um, and the interesting thing out of that, as I go off on a tangent, the interesting thing about that is that my brain didn't know how to see, um, uh, my brain didn't know how to see faces, but it found another way. They call it neuroplasticity. My brain didn't see faces, but it saw bigger detail. It saw the shape of bodies. It saw the way people move. And then years later, I realized I was, I was a very young reporter, very young, sorry, very young editor when I was at the Mail and Guardian. It was my dream job after covering the Truth Commission and following Nelson Mandela. I ended up um, working at the Mail and Guardian, where bizarrely, having never played sport, well, played sport but not been any good. I mean, I went to school with Springbok rugby players like Robbie Kempson and uh, Daryl Cullinan was a few years ahead for me. Shaw van Rensburg was at my school. My skunk, uh, when I was in matric, he didn't even know this conversation happened, but I refused to have a skunk or a I don't know what they called him in other schools, was uh, Justin Kemp, the cricketer. Um, so I had no sporting skills. The only sporty thing I do that I'm any good at is driving a car. It is a sport, you know, even though I can't stand motor racing. And I ended up being the technology editor and the sports editor. And it was really quite funny. And, I, and this is how my career has always been. I've literally been thrown in the deep end, you know, when I was a kid learning to swim in the 70s. That's how they taught you. They taught you how to swim and then they threw you in the deep end. You know, I have this like horrific image in my mind of me being like in the air, partly terrified, partly excited, you know, um, of being thrown in the deep end. And my career has been 
like having to run a construction company, not knowing anything, having to edit a sports section, not knowing who Zinedine Zidane was, you know, <laughs> a scorer of, it was just before I had made the sports editor permanently, just before uh, the 2010 World Cup, I had no idea who Zinedine Zidane was. I, I, you know, but I had to learn sports that I didn't have a passion and an interest for, like cricket. I only like rugby, by the way. I had to learn about cricket and soccer. and It was fascinating. So, so that's what I realized. The brain can do just about anything if you do it. You know, there, there's amazing, these amazing stories of people who have, there was this woman who had a tumor in her head. I mean, it was like the size of a fist. And it was where all of those particular functions were. And her brain, instead of doing it there, it did it somewhere else. This neuroplasticity, your brain will evolve. So um, that's what I started realizing, that, that we are... We are so resistant to change because our brains are not only the most amazing things about us, but in many ways they hold us back because of the way they work. And that's what we need to, to kind of grapple with. And I've done a lot of research. I've read a lot of scientific papers and I've spoken to a lot of scientists and I hope to just explain this quickly and shortly in a way that, that is meaningful for people because our brains are truly the most remarkable thing on the planet. Everything you see right now in front of you, anywhere you look, the computer, the lights, the house, the floor, you know, everything is a direct result of our four brains. And yet we were not the top of the food chain. You know, we were we were cousins to Neanderthals. We were lucky to get where we were, but it's our brains. And it's a couple of things that happened along the way. And the first of those was we worked out how to use tools. This is the oldest thing in the British Museum, and it comes from... Uh, somewhere in East Africa. And it's a hand axe. You can see you'd hold it on the side. You could smash something. You could scrape something. You could cut something. And what that allowed us to do was kill animals, cut the meat, because we don't have the teeth to eat raw meat. You know, I'm sure we do for sushi. Sushi you know, sushi is good for you. Um, and we don't have the intestines to process raw meat. But what we were able to do is not only use tools, but we started using fire. No one knows how, maybe it was a lightning strike, doesn't matter, we got it. And we used fire and we used tools to kill animals, cook the food, which pre-digests it basically, causes the protein bonds to break down, and um, therefore our intestines can use it and we can eat it. And what that gave us was this calorie bonanza. It was like, we didn't know what to do. We had a surplus, you know, it's kind of like ESCOM when they had a power surplus, what do we do with it? I don't know. So suddenly our brains were able to grow, our bodies were able to grow this full brain, amazing full brain, everything about human consciousness, the planet we live in, all of it comes from this full brain and our ability to use tools. So the brain is remarkable and it remembers things and it teaches We've learned, you know, to use a modern word, unprecedented to teach our children things, you know, that we will survive. Um, you know, if, uh, um, you know, if you see a, a, a lion run and climb a tree, if you see a leopard run faster than the guy next to you, is hopefully an accountant from ESCOM. Um, those are the life skills we learned because they were mission critical, to use that, that you know, space term. They were mission critical because if you didn't do them, you'd die. So, so what did we do? We got really good at survival by evolving. Big word for change. So that is our essential nature. The only problem is our brains are designed for human speed. And what is human speed? Walking. We are designed to move at that pace, right? Running, maybe. Especially if you're Kenyan, those beautiful Kenyan runners in the high altitudes. But that's about as fast as our brains were designed to do. The only problem is the world we live in is accelerated in such an incredible way um, that uh, is, is extraordinary. You know, we've, we've accelerated what we can do to such a point that this environment we now live in is so much faster than what our brains were biologically developed to do. So we learn something and then we have to learn something else and it becomes a bit of an obstacle. So what happens in the brain is that it really is a, an extraordinary electrical machine that sends these little impulses down these neurons and dendrites and whatever. Um, and 
it sends a pattern, right? So if you do something often and regularly and repeatedly, your brain's going to say, you need that to survive. That's mission critical. Let's let's reinforce that. So what it does is it builds more neurons, right? It's like a road. You want to go really fast, lay some tar. You know, you want to go really, really fast, make it an autobahn, you know? So our brains have realized that's the way to go. And it's kind of like water running down a slope. It will take the path of least resistance all the time and it'll dig a deeper and deeper groove until it's got this really great, um, really great way of, of, of doing it. So why would our brains want to go another way? You know, the water's always going to go down that pathway. And it, it, it's kind of like that joke about um, uh, the guy, the drunk guy looking for his car keys, for his cars, and the policeman comes up and says, can I help you? And he goes, yeah, I'm looking for my car keys. He goes, did you lose them here? And he went, no, I lost them in that street. He said, well, why are you looking here? He said, because there's a light here, right? So that's what our brain does. Our brain sees the highway. Why, why do you want me to go walk on this little goat path? You know, it's like, you know, uh, sand rails built me a great highway. So your brain just keeps going that way, you know? Um, so, suddenly you've got to convince your brain to go this way. Now, a lot of you may be too young to have had to switch from a BlackBerry to an iPhone or an Android, or if you've ever moved from Windows to Apple or Apple to Windows, you would have experienced this. And, and what it is, is, you know, like a month of pain and suffering, you know, when you're trying to move and do things on different keyboard. And if you've ever gone from Android to an iPhone or iPhone to Android, they're kind of in the same place. It literally takes your brain 21 to 24 hour, uh, 21 to 24 days to rebuild the neural pathway. And you've heard of that phrase, excuse me. You've heard of that phrase that takes 21 days. Uh, sorry, you've heard of that phrase that takes three weeks to break a habit or make a habit because it literally takes 21 to 24 days for your brain to grow a new neural pathway. That's what it's doing. Uh, I found this picture, by the way, on, on Google Images. It's not me. Uh, I was looking for something to illustrate. I'm a non-practicing health fanatic. Um, and that's what our brains do. They become comfortable. That's why we call it the comfort zone. You know, we, why? We, we like sentiment. Why do I want to change? I've always done it that way. It's, I'm comfortable. I'm happy doing it like this. Why do I want to be it differently? And that really is quite a, a remarkable thing, essentially, because... It's basically nostalgia and sentimentality that keeps us moving forward. If we have no choice, like we've had in the last year with COVID, people are like, ah, I don't really want to learn those schools. My grandson can come around and teach me. My grandma, my mother has no choice. I can only talk to her over the telephone or, you know, through a gate for five months. Um, you know, and and that is how we've had to overcome. So when you have no alternative, you do and you overcome it. And that's why the brain is remarkable. People like Elon Musk, he's come along and he's completely revolutionized two of the largest businesses in the world, um, space travel and the automobile industry. They're called uh, behemoths and they, they're very expensive. And, and Warren Buffett, the, the great investment guru, says, they, they, he, says they're business, he likes to invest in businesses with an unassailable moat. Now, thankfully, since Game of Thrones came about and, and aired, I don't have to explain to people what a moat is anymore, but it's a barrier to entry. And, and building, a, building a space rocket and building a, a car factory, they've got to be the most expensive barriers to entry. And yet he's been a pioneer and, and was briefly the richest man in the world. And Tesla is worth more than all the other motor, factoring, motor car manufacturers put together. It's quite remarkable. One of the best examples of, of this mindset is he came along and he's like, North American space industry hadn't built a new rocket since the 60s. And he's like, this is six decade old technology. The cabling inside it, you should have seen the cabling was like this. And he's like, but you just need one ethernet cable. It's the width, the thickness of this finger and it'll, you know, it does everything and it weighs half of that. The, the picture on the left is the, is the Merlin the thousandth Merlin rocket there, you know, he's a sci-fi geek like me. So he does a whole bunch of things sci-fi related. Um, and what he started doing was instead of it costing 300, 200 million to send a rocket into space, it cost 20 million according to test, uh, to SpaceX. And they'd, then they'd start saving, why do we shoot the rocket into the sky? And then 
you know, dump it into the ocean. Why don't we land it on a barge? And he did that a couple of times and it blew up three or four times. By the fourth time, all of us journalists stopped writing about it. But he did have a, a really wonderful phrase. He said, it experienced a rapid unscheduled disassembly. Uh, <laughs> it's a great way for saying it went up in a bang. And I, you know, I heard him speak at a big conference in Austin, Texas called South by Southwest. And he said a really great thing. He said, I really want to die on Mars, just not on impact. So along he came and revolutionize these businesses. Why? Because he doesn't have the legacy. He doesn't have the comfort zone. He doesn't have the old way of doing it. And that is the world that all of you teenagers and, and my children and Sally, or my child and Sally's children are coming into. What are the skills you need? We don't know yet. We don't, we don't know. Well, let me say we do know what the skills are, but we don't know what the jobs are going to be. 15 years ago, there was no Facebook. 20 years ago, there wasn't a Google. These are now the dominant things in the world. There was no such job as a social media manager. I've hired one for each of my publishing businesses, stuff and scrolled it on Africa. They're jobs that just didn't exist two years ago that suddenly exist now. Um, uh, that's the kind of things that have changed in the world in, in the last, time, last few years. So that's what we, we're hoping. Um, that you'll get from this. And if there are questions, I'll put up my, my email address, Toby at Stuff, um, and please feel free to contact me and, and I can help you and ask you those. Um, and just a reminder that, that this is what success looks like. It's a great illustration sent to me by a friend who's, whose business was not doing particularly well. And, and uh, let me even put it like this, I worked for a company that I hated. I used to say, I work for idiots. I used to say to my bosses, I work for idiots. Turns out if you're sarcastic most of the time, when you insult your boss to his face, he thinks you're joking. Whew, teachers, not so much, I warn you. Um, and he sent this to me because I hated my job. And, and now that the dust has settled, I can say his name is Alan Not Craig Jr. And he used to be the CEO of Mixit. And about a year later, he had a fallout with his shareholders. And I... Uh, I sent this back to him. He resigned and left. So that's kind of how the world works. It's uh, kind of like this symbol, you know. So don't be discouraged if uh, if you go on a little bit of a squiggle. And I hope that's meaningful and helpful. Um, thank you very much for joining us. There are the contact details in case you need to get hold of us. Thank you to Cura for organizing this, Angela and your team. Uh, and thank you to Vox for being the sponsor. For a free quote, Call Vox on 087-805-0990 or visit www.vox.co.za. Information and links in the description below.